It's now time for our main event with your host, Chris Tetrold Blaine. Welcome to Once Upon a Turnbuckle. Cool. So, welcome to another episode of Once Upon a Turnbuckle. And since the, the, since the moment that I knew that this guy was going to come on and talk to me, I have been so excited and I went into a little bit of fanboy mode because this guy is, he's a multi-time world champion. He's wrestled in pretty much every part of the world that you can imagine. He's teamed with and wrestled against names that probably belong in every Hall of Fame everywhere. But... um. I'd like to introduce better known in, in these days in the ring as Giant Warrior, Jeff Bearden. Welcome to the show. Hey, good. Thanks. Good to be here, Chris. Yeah, thank you for coming on. I, uh, I, I think I've got probably so many questions, I'm probably not going to get around to them all because <laughs> you're, the, you're looking at your career and everything that you've done and everyone that you've worked with. Uh, we could prop, scra we've scratched the surface, but you know, I'll, I'll see how far we can go. But you, you seem to have... You've been everywhere. You've done everything. Um, I think the easiest thing to do to kick off is probably if we go back to the beginning with you and sort of where it started in terms of sort of before your time in the ring, when did you discover wrestling and, and, and you know, oh, wanted to do it? I was probably six when I started watching wrestling on television, my grandfather. Cool. cool. And it just kind of a, was a pro progression thing. I just kept getting more and more involved with it. You know, I think I was probably 10 when I saw my first live match that my parents took me to. Cool. cool. So what, then, of, what, who, who, was, who was around at the time that really sort of dragged you in? When I, when I, where I grew up was in Amarillo, Texas. And I mean, that was one of the big hot spots for, for professional wrestling in the mm -hmm. 70s. You know, so I grew up and stuff with Dorian Terry Funk and yeah. Dick Murdoch and Ricky Romero and, you know, all those guys. Mm. And I went to school, actually, with Dory Funk Jr.'s kids. You know, oh, they were all my age. So, so I used to hang out with them and stuff. And that was kind of what got me. My dad was Dory's son's football coach. Okay, wow. So it kind of became a thing. And stuff. <laughs> I got to know Dory pretty well. And he would always leave me tickets and stuff for the wrestling matches every week. And, wow. You know, whether I win or not. Yeah. So you got so, you got brought you got brought up with the best around you really. I mean, yeah, you, you could, yeah. There's a lot of great talent that went through Amarillo. So yeah. you know, once I realized a little bit what was going on in the business, I mean, you know, I got to see Andre and the Sheik and Art Baker and Abdullah the Butcher. You know, those are all the big monsters that they brought in. But you know, Ted DiBiase got his start there. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, there was a lot of great talent and stuff that was in that came from that Amarillo area. So it's, it's a good pedigree to really have around you if that's what you if you decide that's what you want to go into. Right. Um, right. So, I mean, what when can you remember when you decided you wanted to you 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 wanted to seriously start training and and get in the ring yourself? Probably when I was eighteen. You know, I guess I was finishing up my last year of high school. And I had talked to uh, to Dory and Terry Funk both, yeah. And they said they would train me and stuff as long as I had a college degree. Okay, yeah. So, yeah. which That's was fine nice. because I was going to college on a basketball scholarship anyway. Cool, cool. Yeah. So, so you, did you play play professionally basketball? Did I see? Yeah, I played in Belgium for a few months. That's very cool. And had some contract issues and came home. Okay, and then you decided that wrestling was was there waiting for you pretty much i was on the phone a couple of days after getting there getting back from europe what were they like as, as teachers you know was it was it really because obviously they're they're very renowned back in the day for you know being one of the best technical wrestlers out there right and then terry so well, was, was all, all my actual training in the ring and stuff was with dory okay you know what I mean? He was one of the best technical wrestlers. And at that time, you know, he was, I think he's the only world champion for the NWA that lasted for four and a half years. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, and then when Dory wasn't working with me, I was working with Dick Murdoch. Mm -hmm. So I'd gone out to the Carolinas and so I was in Charlotte. So I, my first match was actually for Jim Crockett Promotions. Cool. Okay. Who, who was that against? Uh, Ricky Gibson. 
Okay. Robert Gibson from Rock and Roll Express, his brother. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah, that was my first match. And if you can imagine, is he is he built like Robert? Sort of quite kind of one? yeah, because a little, little stockier. So so to enlighten some fans who maybe listen to this who may not be familiar with you, you're you're quite a different build to those oh, yeah. guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm I'm legitimately seven foot tall. Yeah. Half inch over seven. Yeah. And you know, at the time and stuff. Well, when I first started wrestling, I really looked like a basketball player. Yeah. You know, I was about 285 or something like wow. that, which for seven-foot guys then. Yeah. But, you know, as my career progressed, I got heavier. And, you know, I spent a good part of my career between 340 and 370. Yeah, okay. So one of the – one of the you a, a giant in more, more than just a name, really. You were legitimately right. – yeah. So, so after you had your start then in um, – Jim Crockett and the NWA um, mm-hmm. at that point. So where did you go from there? Because you ended up, like I mentioned at the start of the show, you ended oh, up everywhere. Yeah, I, I wasn't getting a whole lot of matches when I started with, with Crockett. So, I mean, I started looking at the, what they called outlaw back then, which is now like the indie scene now. Yeah. So I was starting to do some shows with some promotions there in uh, Alabama for a while. Uh, then I kind of moved to a little place in uh, Florida. I was in Pensacola, Florida for a little bit. And, you know, after that, I, I, you know, I'd left there. I was doing some shows, I think, in Texas. And somebody contacted me about going to Mexico for the first time. Cool. So that was really – 89 would have been my first experience. Of, no, 88 would have been my first experience of working internationally. Mm. And then I made most of my career working international. I didn't work in the States a lot. No. Because no, you were, um, I think it was, was it Mexico and, and South Africa that you, you oh. probably had your, would you say your sort of most success over there? Yeah, I had a lot of good success in South Africa. I mean, I, I loved South Africa in general. I mean, I was over there for a better part of two years, and I was there for five straight years. Yeah. When they when they asked me to come in and help with the wrestling office, so I lived over there for five years. So I, I absolutely loved South Africa. I loved the fans and stuff over there were crazy, <laughs> but you know I loved it. What was it like, um, sort of taking the wrestling side to begin with? And we'll talk about sort of what out of the out of the ring was like in you know these other countries. Right. But how how did the actual the the wrestling the attitudes towards the actual uh, wrestling itself differ sort of in all those different countries in the states as far as the fans the fans or, or the attitudes or within the promotions either really well the fans were always different because there were a lot of the international places i that i went to that would always tell me and stuff oh our wrestling here is is real it's not like the fake stuff in america right well i mean it was still professional wrestling and stuff so it's always still preset and choreographed and everything else Mm. but you know the fans and stuff to me were a lot livelier in foreign countries because they weren't just oversaturated with wrestling Mm. you know most of my career was pre-internet yeah so i mean that's made a big difference and stuff with where wrestling is gone Mm. Uh, but that would you know the wrestlers and stuff were all basically the same and you know they all it was a craft they all perfected their craft mm-hmm. and i mean some places they weren't as good as what the american people were i mean you know we yeah. started professional wrestling over here yeah and so a lot of people didn't have the you know the training that our wrestlers in the states had for a while now and stuff they're all in pretty good shape so um you know i just always enjoyed working international because of that reason they weren't the fans and stuff were more lively they weren't the uh, educated internet mm. you know, gossip guys completely different this is why i like the whole point of my podcast is is really focusing on the era i grew up with which is the 80s and 90s and right it, it was a, it's a world away from where it is now i i, I i'm not sure that there's probably a, a great deal of of fans that are growing up with the new product that will really probably understand the draw of right what I call the golden era because it's so vastly different. It's not, like you said, it's not, um, uh, what's the word? It's not influenced by things like the media and, and, and that. You right. Know, 
Um, talking about the fans being lively, I've seen I've seen some. Um, there were some incidences you've been involved or, or, or that you caused, sort of. If I said like, riots and stuff like that, how how no. really would be my question? You know, I, just had a very, I had a very aggressive style. Hmm. You know, I my, my style and stuff. I took a little bit of stuff from Bruiser Brody and things like that, and that kind of became my style. It was more yeah. of a, an aggressive roughhouse kind of guy. And you know, you take when you're coming in as the American, a lot of times stuff. You know, we were the big bad guys because. People don't always like Americans. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm seven foot and I'm wrestling against some guy six two. And, you know, next thing you know, I pull a spike out of my boot and stab him in the head with it. You know, oh, it's, was, we're talking proper brutal stuff here. We're oh, yeah. They steel just chairs and whatever. Yeah, they didn't uh, always appreciate the fact that I was as big as I was, but I would still cheat. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Probably didn't so, think I mean, to do that. He probably should have been the other way around, really. But yeah, it's been crazy and stuff. I mean, I I was stabbed five times uh, by spectators. Wow. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, caused I don't, I don't know how many riots, dozens. Um, you know, I've had guns pulled on me. But this is just um, really because of your persona, how you are in the uh, ring. This is just purely because of that. Because they take everything kind of locally. So when you get the local, you know, baby face and stuff or the big hero of the country and stuff and he's in the ring and now you're doing all this bad stuff to him, <laughs> you know, it, they just took it personally and tried to help. You know, I've had people get in the ring with me. Wow. <laughs> did, you so ever walk, did you ever walk away from that and, and sort of think, actually, I'm, I'm happy with that. I've done my job. Or did you? Oh, sure. Was, it was, sure. Did you ever get like obviously moments of being scared, like how far is this going to go? Or um, you know there was that limit to it? I, I don't know that I really got scared as it was happening. I got back to the dressing room a lot of times. It's like, thank God I made it out of this one. But, you know, I've had uh, a, tire, a tire rim they used as a, a barrier, so they had a post in it. Yeah. And I had somebody drop one of those off on my head, stuff from a balcony. God, and just hit me in the top of the head and just peeled my head down. Oh my God! Wow. So yeah, first time was in Mexico City, then uh, second time was Dominican Republic, and then the last three were all in South Africa. Because I I wasn't familiar, and I'm probably still not massively familiar, intimately with the international scene that you're talking about and that. But I remember seeing reports of it back in the magazines when I was growing up, and it always looked they always right. focused on the sheer brutality of it. Would would that be sort of linked to the fact, like you say, like the the fans took, they they were very being very local. They took everything quite personally, and it was right. From, did that influence what was happening in the ring, or was it always set out? Do you think to be to have these brutal matches down there? Well, there? I mean, I always had that aggressive style. Had a lot of bloody matches and things mm -hmm. like that in my career. But yeah, I mean, some of the things you would learn, what you could say. It would entice a little more animosity towards me and stuff. So, I mean, I would, you know, on top of what all I was doing in the ring to the wrestler and stuff like that, I would still kind of taunt them as well. So, so I caused a lot of my own problems. <laughs> probably, probably hard not to, to be fair. But um, looking at some of the guys that you worked with, it's, it's not – difficult to see how you ended up in matches like that people like abdul right. the butcher he's one that again growing up he terrified me i loved wrestling with abdul he was one of my favorite people ever to be in the ring with just because that was the kind of mad you know, the yeah was it was he real sort of night night and day between what he's like in the ring and what oh he's like yeah abby's one of the the nicest gentlemen you could actually ask for mm. you know he's very polite very well mannered very well dressed yeah you know so i mean Abby was completely different outside of the ring than what he was in there. Thankfully. <laughs> Thankfully, I suppose. Yeah. Because <laughs> I've, I've seen him on some documentaries lately and he's, he's completely, I mean, he's, you know, obviously he's looked, you know, over the years, he, he's, he's sort of aged a bit and everything, but he's... Yeah, he's expected. in a wheelchair now. Yeah, he's completely not what I would have expected, really, him to be like, because, I mean, my early memory of him when he was in WCW in 91... And he was he was like partners with Cactus Jack and feuding with Sting and that. Obviously. Right. He's he's in there with the right guys to incite 
hatred from the fans because he's there with the biggest hero that you could you could get um when you were wrestling were, were either of you like the baby face or was this like a I was. my my first um probably five six years of wrestling and stuff i was a baby face most of the time um and you know, when I first started working with Abdul, it was in Puerto Rico, which is another kind of violent, mm. you know, place to wrestle. But I, I was a baby face my whole, the two years I was in Puerto Rico. So, oh, yeah. you know, so I started off working with him as a baby face. And of course, we wrestled in Japan. And that was, you know, we were kind of neutral in Japan. Yeah. I was going to touch on that next, actually, because I think one of the, if you, if you put your name in, or, you know, into YouTube, uh, one of the matches that comes up straight away is uh, is you against Andre the Giant, right? Um, you're team, teaming with Tyler Main, I believe, mm -hmm. at the time against Andre and um, Giant Baba. Giant Baba. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What was, I mean, obvious question. What was it like to be in the ring with Andre the Giant? It was. I was kind of in awe at first. You know, it was just, you know, it just kind of hit me like this is Andre the Giant. Mm. You know, and I mean, you know, when we got in, there was a place in there you saw where Andre and I went to lock hands. And I kind of pulled my hand back because I have never seen anybody make my hands look small. <laughs> and I mean, I was barely getting up over, you know, maybe to the first digit of Andre's fingers and stuff over his palm. And I mean, I've got a big hand. Yeah. You know, playing basketball, palming a basketball was never a problem. No. You know, but I mean, his hands just made mine look small. And I guess I had a shocked look on my face or something because Andre kind of giggled a little bit over it. <laughs> you know, so. Was he, was he fun to be in the ring with? You know, I never really got to wrestle with Andre enough. No. You know, I only worked with him, I think, once in Japan was the only time I got to work with Andre. Mm. Uh, I would have loved to have wrestled Andre 15 years past for him yeah. and about five or six years forward for me in my career yeah. when I, I would have loved it to have been at that point to wrestle Andre when I, you know, I, I could pretty well hold my own with anybody. I knew where I was, you know, I was still really young when I went to Japan for the first time. I think I'd only been wrestling maybe three years, wow. you know, so I was, I was pretty young. So it would, like I said, I would have loved to wrestle him when I had more experience and he was younger when he could move well. That's, that's what I, I, looking at the era that was, that was, I think, 1990, possibly that. Yeah, that and he, he was, yeah, really towards the end of, of his career, probably a little bit past where he should have been. And it was good to see him in the ring, but it's sad to see where he was a few years before. You know, right. Even WrestleMania three with Hulk Hogan, I think you start to see him being a little more limited than what he was way back when he started. Oh, yeah, because I can remember watching Andre when, you know, when I was a kid, when they'd bring him in to Amarillo, mm. and he would wrestle like they bring the Sheik in. Yeah. And, I mean, Andre and the Sheik were all over the building, up up the yeah. stairs, over the concession stands, and everything <laughs> else. And, I mean, by the time I got to wrestle with him, he couldn't move that well anymore. Yeah. Such a shame. I, I watched, it was the first time, the oldest match I've watched of Andre's recently. I mean, when he, he won one of his first championships, I think. Might have been in Canada or France, I can't remember. But I mean, he, he, he it might not have been quick, but he was moving around the map like a yeah. proper amateur wrestler would do, you know. And, and growing up with the image of him like I had, you wouldn't have expected that at all. Well, and I, I think and stuff, if I remember correctly, when before Andre started wrestling and stuff, he, he actually played soccer in France and was a goalie. <laughs> I can't imagine anything getting past him. No, but you got to be able to move a little bit to be yeah, a goalie. You do, you do. That's impressive. So. That's impressive. So, um, one of the guys that I've, I've mentioned that you worked with, especially in that match, was uh, again another guy that I remember um, from my early days as a wrestling fan, Tyler Main, right. who was in WCW as Nitron. How did you? How did you two meet? So, where did that partnership come from? Um, there was a, an old promoter out of Arkansas, uh, Bill Ash, and he was running a show and wanted to bring us, bring me, he had him because he was more local to Oklahoma, I think, at that time. Mm. 
And so Billy contacted me to come in and work with him and stuff. So he wanted to have this battle of the giants kind of thing. Yeah. And um, Daryl, Daryl, I think it was like 6'10", and then I was seven foot. So after the matches, after the match was over, and so he pulled us in when he was paying us. He said, "We two guys ever thought about doing a tag team and going to Japan?" It was like no, because I was doing a cowboy gimmick at that time. Okay. And Daryl was doing all the, the he was doing the makeup and yeah. with the, the nitron thing. Yeah. And so we decided, so you know, the cowboy gimmick was so used, oversaturated, just didn't have much meaning to it anymore. No. We decided to go with the makeup. And so I called Dory, you know, because at the time the funks and stuff had a big say in what was going on with the All Japan office. Yeah. And so Dory and stuff sent us to Puerto Rico. And then some things happened and stuff down there to where Daryl didn't come down. So the first time we actually tagged together was the first match we had in Japan. Oh, okay. So we didn't have a lot of experience together, which I thought was another thing I felt kind of hurt us. Yeah. We just weren't that cohesive with it. Mm. You know, and that was the only time that we ever worked together was when we went to Japan. So we just didn't have, you know, that continuity. I think you you marketed well. I mean, it, it marketed right. That is a team, I mean, in the... In the era of demolition, the Road Warriors, Powers of Pain, I mean, you would have fit right in, to be fair. I mean, looking back, I wish they'd have come up with, you know, when I went to Puerto Rico, they were the one, Carlos Colon was the one that gave me the, the Giant Warrior name. Okay. And I wish that he, they would have done something, you know, a little different with it, because there was already an Ultimate Warrior, there was Road Warriors. Yeah. You know, all of us were wearing makeup, Sting was wearing makeup. Yeah. You know, so I mean, it, to me and stuff, I, you know, I, I fell into my gimmick and stuff. I just wish sometimes it would have been different. Yeah. How long did the giant warrior gimmick last for? Um, I started that in 1990, and I think I quit doing 98. Okay. Okay. Yeah. When did you wrestle up up till? Was that sort of towards the end of? No, I retired in 2017. Wow, okay. <laughs> my man, I, I had 30 years. Time. Yeah, fantastic. So my last match was actually in Germany. Okay, yeah. In uh, Bremen. But, you know, I, I, I was in South Africa for such a long time without leaving. Mm. I was starting to get a little bit stale because people had seen me for so long. Yeah. yeah. So I took a few... Uh, couple of months off and then they had thought you know we let people believe that i'd gone to wrestle and i think for wcw okay or something i'd gone back to the states to wrestle and uh, i came back with you know tiger steel right and so you know after that i think probably my last year in uh south africa i was wrestling as tiger steel and then from there on i went you know, I was I did spent most of my two thousands in Europe. Cool. Yeah, I believe I was, you you were over in I was the UK, UK right? for a while. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Who did you wrestle for when you were over here? What sort of area was that? Uh, first time I started was with All Stars, and I think the office is in Birkenhead. Okay. Yeah. That was where we used to stay. That's where I always stayed was in Birkenhead. Okay. Um, then I worked for Scott Conway for a while. I think it's TWA. Yeah. Okay. And he was in Southampton. Okay, yeah, that's not far from where I'm from, actually. Sort of okay. The area. Yeah, I'm not too, not too far from that. My dad lives in Portsmouth, which is like the next town. Okay, yeah, so, I know where that is. I've yeah. wrestled in Portsmouth several times. Oh, yeah, okay, cool, cool. I must have liked that to, could you remember where the venue was in Portsmouth? Because they haven't got many there. Oh, God, it's something along a, a coastline, I remember. Some just kind of a bingo hall or a dance okay. hall or something. Because they had... Um, there's a venue they used to take a swim in there. It's called the Pyramids. I know they had some. That sounds I familiar. Would, yeah, if it was that, I was I was there when I was a kid as well. I loved it down there. Yeah, I was. I worked in England from probably 2000 to 2003. Okay, very cool. I was, shame I didn't get down there really to uh, to see. It. I was I moved away around about that time. I was at uni a bit further away. Who did at that you? Point. Yeah, but, uh, that but I worked all over the UK and stuff during that time. And, 
you know, worked in Wales for a promoter out of Wales for a little while. Um, can't remember exactly. Org Williams. Org Williams was a guy and stuff and I was working for in Wales. Yeah. You know, great guys. Enjoyed wrestling in England a lot. The, um, the, the, the British scene, I must admit, is, I mean, I think there's more avenues to go uh, with um, independent wrestling and particularly the British scene yeah. now. There's so many ways, they, like with, especially with NXT, they've got some, somewhere over here that they can aim for now. Um, but certainly in the last 20 years, it's really exploded from what it used to See, be. See, I'm good friends with um, Ricky Knight that has oh. the WAW in Norwich. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I was actually their first world champion. Was he? Okay, wow. That's pretty cool. Who did you defeat then? Do you remember? Uh, Cannonball Grizzly. Is that the guy oh, that used to be PN News? PN News. Very cool. Yeah, I beat him for the belt. At that time, I changed my character and stuff to a uh, gladiator. I was working as Colossus the Gladiator and stuff okay. the latter part of my career. And I wished I would have had that character from the very beginning. I was going to say, out of your characters and that, which, have you got a preference as to which one you enjoy? I, I came up with the idea and stuff from watching Gladiator. Okay, simple. Yeah, you know, That was where the, and I was, just got to thinking about it. And I'm like, you know, they've never really had a true Gladiator character. You know, they put guys in a mask and stuff and they wear out a, a leather skirt or something like that and call themselves the Gladiator. Mm. But they'd never, I'd never seen that care. I'd seen Vikings and Cowboys and Indians. Yeah. You know, painted guys and everything else. I just never saw a Viking. I mean, I, I just never saw that. Uh, the Gladiator gimmick. The Gladiator character. And I think of a so guy I, your I size. That would be. Yeah, kind of posing really. To see it that really, it, it looked good on camera and in film and stuff like that. So I mean, it was. I I really wished I'd had that from the very beginning and yeah. taken it throughout my career. Hindsight's a wonderful thing, isn't it? It is. It is. <laughs> so um, there's another part of your career of, of some of the guys that you worked with as well, which I, I wanted to touch on because you um, was it was it in Mexico that you um, you were around Rodney. Anoa'i, Yokozuna. Yeah, yeah, that's where Rod and I first started tagging together. Wow. And if you ask me, he was one of the, he was the greatest person I've ever met. Really? Wow. Yeah, he he had the greatest spirit and soul and heart that you could ever ask out of a person. Yeah. And we were going into Mexico for two weeks, going home for four, and then coming back in for two weeks. And we did that, God, almost two years. Okay. So I mean, we were. Um, we were real compatible with each other, very good friends. You know, we talked to each other all the time, and so when we worked in Mexico, do you, so did you travel with him? Yeah, yeah. Do you do you remember any kind of any any stories, any anything, uh, any occasions that really stick with you from back then? Well, you know, he, Rod was so big, you know, that it was hard for him to fit in you know, certain vehicles. So, I mean, we were always in bands in Mexico. So, mm. you know, because they had to fit us and sometimes a couple other wrestlers and stuff in there with us. Yeah. And so we always traveled in bands. But, um, you know, it was funny. When I was living in South Africa, I was doing a lot of bodyguarding work. Okay. When I, when I wasn't wrestling. And the promotional people that brought in all the big acts, you know, Tina Turner and Krista Berg and people like that, uh, they were bringing in WWE, so they called and asked us. They said, "Y'all, would y'all be interested in bodyguarding some wrestlers?" Okay. And I was like, "Oh, great! I get paid to run around with some of my friends I haven't seen in a long time." Awesome. Sure. Well, my main job and stuff was to drive Rodney around. Okay. Because I had to drive a van and stuff to fit him. So I mean, it was you know it was just me and him most of the time, and then sometimes. Uh, Rikishi would ride with us, but he was working as the Sultan, I think, at the time. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah. You know, so it would only be the three of us if we, if we were going. Most of the time, it was just me and him. Mm. So, you know, it was really good stuff. We, you know, we got connected. We were kind of apart because I had moved to South Africa and was out of touch with everybody. Right. And, you know, then I got, then we ran into each other when I was doing the bodyguarding thing, and then we just kind of stayed in touch. And then we did a couple other tours, Saudi Arabia. And, you know, he was the one that contacted me about doing the, the English tour and stuff that he died on. Oh, wow. Okay. You know, I was, I was one of the ones that was there 
uh, the founding. And so I had, I helped as far as with the fa- you know, I had to contact the family and you know, I talked to Afa and Rikishi and um, his sister, Rodney's sister flew out. So, so I helped her with the arrangements and stuff of what was going on for her. You know, the hotel we were staying in and that he was staying in in Liverpool and stuff was so nice and generous with everything. Mm-hmm. You know, as far as providing us rooms, letting me call whoever I needed to call. Mm-hmm. And so they were they were really good. I can't remember what the name of the hotel was. And stuff. I mean, you know, he was there probably almost a week before they got him home. Oh, wow. So it was, it was rough. I mean, I, I still miss him today. And, you know, every October 23rd, I still have a shot of Jack Daniels for him. This has been, God, this has been 21 years Yeah, this year. Was it, um, I know that, I think when it happened amongst the community, it probably wasn't a massive surprise because of his size. But was it, I mean, did you did you feel at some point he was, he was on borrowed time at some point, or did he just seem to keep on going? He just seemed to keep going, you know. He knew when he got released from WWE because he got so big, I mean, after that, so he got up to like 700 pounds Mm. and, you know, we were talking that Vince was wanting to bring Rodney back if he ever got under 600. Yeah. Well, he was down to about 625 when we were in England, Mm -hmm. but you know, he said he was struggling with it and having some issues with, you know, with his health in other ways. Yeah. You know, he's just a massive guy who, most of his life, it just took its toll on his heart. Yeah, and I mean, I, we had just got through doing like a four or five day road trip and everything cool. else. Yeah, that that was rough, yeah. you know, for for big guys to be traveling and yeah, at least cramped up fans and stuff for that long. Yeah. See, I I I've heard a lot, of, particularly in the last year or so I think I've, I've listened to podcasts that have been dedicated to, you know let, for me, I knew what he was like in the ring but I didn't know much else about him um, Right. That was, a, that was a nice you know, and I, I've not heard anyone say anything bad about him, I think Jim Ross always speaks. I don't think you can find him. anybody that's got anything no. bad just even, even in the ring um, people were saying they felt very safe with him, you know, despite his size because he moved well, he knew you know, there's some other big guys that were quite clumsy and would be. Yeah, there were. Famous. I mean, I've wrestled. I wrestled against him in Puerto Rico. Wow. You know, where and it was like we had just got off of a Mexican tour, and I had gone home to Puerto Rico, and he flew in and the next weekend, and we wrestled each other. You know, so That's you know, I, and I was always felt safe when I was in the when I was working against him. I hmm. didn't worry about anything. Uh. You know, and you look at it, especially when he would drop that leg and everything and stuff, you know, it looks like it kills you. Yeah. I mean, it, there wasn't much to it. No. I think Bret Hart, probably WrestleMania 9, he sold that leg drop the best I've ever seen it. Because yeah. Because it's really quite fearful. Yokozuna, Demolition, all the guys like that who were just brutal. They were huge. They were, they were just brutal in the ring. They really terrified me as a kid when they were up against people like Bret because I thought he's not going to come in. You know, they will destroy him. And I thought in that match several times that he, 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 you know, he wasn't coming back from that move. But, you know, they... You would have hated me during the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> I probably would. I probably would. But um, talk, uh, there's one match that I wanted to talk about in particular, actually, which um, I don't know, it might be... I, I would say probably one of your most notable ones if I was looking back on it sort of being yourself, but um against the barbarian. Yep. Yeah. Um the crowd how big was the crowd there? Over twenty thousand, probably twenty five, twenty six. Sizable sort of and where, whereabouts was that? Is that out in Puerto sorry? Rico? That's Puerto Rico. That's Puerto Rico. Is this the one for and the Barbara's another one that I got to be very good friends with and yeah. you know, we traveled and did shows in different countries together. You're probably one of the only guys I've seen. A, I've seen a picture of that match as well, and you're probably one of the only guys that makes him look small. That I've seen. He does. I had to look twice to see if it was him. It yeah, was, he was just so big and so strong. Yeah. God, was, a couple of times when he would slam me or something like that, he get me up so easy without me even realizing I was going up. <laughs> you know. So I mean, yeah. Super nice guy and stuff. All the guys from the islands, the, yeah. the Samoans and the Tongans, and 
That's all thing. those guys and stuff are great guys. Because you've, you've spent a lot of time, yeah, like, like with him and, and Yokozuna yeah. and um, the head shrinkers and that as well. Are they like as much of a family on the road and in the ring as yes. you would expect? Yeah. yeah, they are. They're very tight when they're on the road together. Yeah. So the, the match with the Barbarian, this was for the, was for the NWA, in, if I remember rightly. Uh, oh, you're thinking about the one where we wrestled in India. Yeah, the crowd, I'm that looking at that, 75,000. 75,000 people. That's, yeah, they, that's a serious. They, and that was what they counted. They actually broke down a fence and people were coming in through the hole in the fence. Oh, wow. Okay. So I don't know what the actual um, count would have been at the end of the day. Is that what, what, what drew people to that match in particular, do you think, or that event? They hadn't, India at that time and stuff never really saw professional wrestling except for what they could see on television. They weren't, you know, they, they'd never seen live pro wrestling. Mm, okay. So it was a definite oddity for them. I, you know, I don't think it was really our match and stuff that drew that many people. I think it was just the fact that they'd never seen wrestling. Yeah. You just it was, you just happened to be sort of at that point of the bill, you know. And the, yeah, uh, was that was that the main event of the the event, or was yes. there more to follow? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that was the main event. And I was working babyface there actually. Okay, yeah, cool, cool. Because that was I'm just trying to think what the year was actually. Was that nine thousand early nineties? He would have been nine. Yes. Ninety three. Yeah. So he had his um, what you, what you consider sort of the the stereotypical WWF character right. the horns and the fur and everything like that right it's um i i used to love that character when when i was when, when i was growing up it was just so striking you know a lot of people yeah. smash him for it because they're very favorable to his powers of pain era and he was another one i was so safe when i was in the ring with him so i never worry about a night with him no no this he's i'll show you this actually while i'm in On my wall of fame. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Autographed as well. That's it. That's it. When I knew that was coming up, I had to have it. So, so yeah. Is there any any sort of particular memories of wrestling in in front of a crowd that big? They, you know, the actual match itself. Do you, do you remember sort of being there and um, you know in that position in that in that high spot on the card in front of a crowd like that? You know it was. The one thing I remember more than anything else is that was how tightly packed the people were by the ring. Okay. Yeah. You know, I bet you we didn't have five, maybe six feet between the crowd and us in the ring. So that made it a little difficult because, I mean, you know, Barb and I both are kind of guys and stuff that like going outside the ring and doing stuff outside. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of hard to do that and stuff because there just wasn't any space for people, yeah. you know way and they're all wanting to touch you as you're trying to do things and you know it made it tough but that was the biggest thing was just looking out and just seeing a sea of people yeah just you know, realize they were people at some point or just you know yeah i've wrestled in some big shows and places you know 25 30 000 people and stuff but i've never seen anything like 75 no no that's sort of like wrestlemania 3 sort of uh, yeah yeah it, it was yeah. it was it was kind of a a crazy thing to look out, you know, look out from backstage and stuff and just see how many people there were. And I mean, there was third match or so, you're still watching people just pouring into the gates. <laughs> you know, was, that was the craziest thing for me. I never worked at a crowd that big. No. So you just go out there and just try to treat it as any other one, I suppose, don't you? And give them a good night. Once you get in the rain, you don't really, you know, when you work the crowds, a different thing. But I mean, as far as how many are actually in the building, mm. I never really paid that much attention, except for like what's around ringside stuff. Yeah. There are people I could, you know, harass myself to, to get a uh, to get a response. Yeah. Um, in terms of sort of preparing for a match, are you more of a fan of you know going out there, sort of calling it in the ring, or or do you? Do you do you like to know sort of the, the steps you're going to take beforehand? What's your sort of style? I kind of like, you know, I was always kind of, a, I guess, a modified of the two. 
you know, I never had a problem because that was how I broke into the business was calling it in the ring. I mean, yeah. we got how to start maybe a couple of high spots in the middle and mm. how the match was going to end and everything else was up to us at that point. Yeah. You know, but, you know, I kind of like, I got to where I kind of like knowing a little better of what we're going to do. So, I mean, I would have it be more structured than what I was uh, used to in the back. But there was, you know, I still tell them if I see something, I want to change it. Yeah. You know, and call it on the fly. I suppose you've got to be working with someone who, who you can bounce that off of as well. Yeah, that always helps and stuff. And, I mean, I've I've been in dressing rooms on indie shows and stuff like that. You know, you'll get guys come up to the old vets, mm. you know, and ask them something, you know, what do you want to do? You want to walk through a match? Ah, don't worry about it. We'll call it in the ring. And their eyes get so big, and it's just like, <laughs> how do you do that? <laughs> Did you find later on in your career, as, as the wrestling scene as a whole changed, as the industry changed, did you find more and more that um, you were with guys who needed it planning out before and, and yeah. the, the art of calling it? sort of right. to die off yeah I, it, it was a lot easier and stuff working on independent shows and things like that with guys i'd never worked with just to walk through the whole basic match and i would always still preference and stuff you know if i see something else that's yeah. going to work i'm yeah. going to change what's your take on on where wrestling is now compared to sort of when you were in it um i'm not a big fan of it i enjoyed the psychology that we used you know, when I was, you know, in the 80s and 90s, where we were still kind of working holds. Yeah. When wrestling was still where people were questioning, is it real or is it not? Yeah. You know, I enjoyed that stage. It was, that was part of it was to make the people believe we were doing what it looked like we were doing in the ring. I mean, yeah. that was part of the art of psychology. Yeah. And now and stuff, you know, there's so many these flips and flops that they do off of the ropes and everything. Mm. And you just see the guys laying there waiting for it. Yeah. You know, cause that's the spot we got to run. So mm. I'm going to sit here for two minutes while he's positioning himself to do yeah. the little flip. Well, why don't you move? It's, it's almost like they've accepted that everyone knows the <laughs> truth now. So what's the point in. Right. Sort of right. Up to it. Exactly that. I mean, we tried to, we get the people pissed at us and stuff just for working an arm. Right. You know, when you're stomping on somebody's arm for 10 minutes and stuff, yeah. I mean, people are getting mad. Yeah. And now and stuff, if you have much wrestling in a match, they look at it and call it boring. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I was hopeful when things like NXT and that came out. I thought it's, it's starting to go back to the appreciation of the actual the art of wrestling. And I always like the high flies and things like that. But the, the more I've watched lately of the more current stuff, sort of the last sort of five years or so, it is, you can tell it is so choreographed. It's impressive what they do. Oh, but sure. like you say, the way they're setting it up is just, it's disappointing that they're having yeah, to the do Yeah, the guys that. and stuff, um, you know, the guys of today, it's, they're, they're just used to running, the, it's, it's more of a spot fest. Mm. You know, it's to see how much, and I mean, I remember what Dory showed me a match of his when I was first training against Antonio Inoki. And they went for like an hour and a half. Wow, yeah. And I think there was five high spots in the whole match. Mm. Everything yeah. was working holds. Yeah. Yeah. And that was accepted back then and people yeah. loved it. That's the masterpiece was having a match. Oh, yeah. Right yeah. You do an hour and a half time limit and stuff, that's a long time. Yeah. For five high spots. Yeah. And and they go home, the fans go home thinking they've they've had their money's worth. Rather than, oh, I've seen so-and-so jump off the top of a cage or I've seen, you know, yeah, they did this, like you say, this many backflips to line up to a clothesline or something like that. Yeah, I mean, they do so much stuff now that, that the old psychology of when I was in makes no sense. No, no. You know, and so, I mean, it, the product's a completely different, you know, creature now than what it was mm. 80s, 90s, even early 2000s. To, the, the biggest difference probably is that there, there is no, what you call it back in the day, kayfabe. Um, right. You know, everybody knows that as soon as those cameras are off or they're out of the ring, you know, everyone's friends or whatever. What was it like back in your day when that was still a thing? You know, did you, did, if you were a heel, did you have to stick with heels outside? Could you, could you not mention? Yeah. 
Yeah, in Puerto Rico, that was one of the rough things for me is because that was really my first big territory to work in. Mm. But I was a baby face. Yeah. And I was the only American baby face that was working there. So all the other Americans that lived in the apartments with me and so were all heels. Right. So, I mean, we had to do stuff behind doors. We couldn't go to the restaurant or walk down to the deli and get a sandwich. You know, we just couldn't do that. I mean, I was only allowed to socialize with um, with baby faces. And, I mean, the office actually told me, so don't be seen out with these guys. Yeah. And so the only two guys I was able to really do things with were was a mass tag team. So okay. People didn't know who they were and stuff <laughs> on the street without their masks on. Right. So that was really about the only time, you know, and I ended up moving away from that into a condo down, you know, down the street. So guys would sneak over and come see me, but I would never leave my apartment to, to let them in. Wow. I just let everybody up. So your, your lifestyle really was dictated by it in a sense, because you didn't really have the freedom to kind of move around with whoever you right. place. Yeah, it was, it was, it was a lot different than, you know, you'll see, as long as they're not wrestling each other, mm. then you'll see the guys and stuff today and stuff, you know, exactly. heels, baby faces are arriving together. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so it's a lot different than what ours was. I mean, I kind of missed the kayfabe days. You know, it was kind of that um, feeling and stuff that we separated away from everybody else. You know, we acted different. We talked different. Yeah. And things like that. So it was, it was, I kind of miss those days. It was fun back then. I think there's still some independent uh, promotions, especially over over in the UK. I've heard of it where they still have a heel dressing room and mm-hmm. a, a babyface dressing room, and in never the twins shall meet. You come out of separate um, entrances into the you know into the the room into the arena. Yeah, they used to. I mean, you know, some of the older territory things in their big arenas, they had big dressing rooms and stuff with two different entrances. Yeah. So babyface go out one side, heel go out the other side. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's the whole kayfabe thing and stuff is pretty much gone now. Which is a shame. Going back to just one one more question that sort of popped into my head. Going back to sort of the kind of matches that you had, you know, the, the more sort of the, the hardcore, as they would call it nowadays. The right. Matches. Um, I mean, you see guys like Abdullah, I think New Jack as well is one that springs to mind where you can physically see the effects. New of- Jack's a different creature. You can physically see the the effects that these kind of matches have had on them. I mean, has is is, is, is any of that affected you physically? Um, well, it's it's hard to say because I now have Parkinson's. Oh, okay. So I have to, I have to deal with my Parkinson's, and my doctors have said you know said probably all the chair shots and some of the concussions and things like that that I got from wrestling or other things in my life. Mm you know, it's probably contributed a lot to me having Parkinson. Okay. But, because I mean, as big as I was, even as a baby face and stuff, you know, heels that have to use chairs, Yeah. you know, to bring me down. So it always made sense that, you know, to, to use a chair on, you know, you know, I would use them too. So, I mean, you really get to receive it. And I was never one of the guys that put my hand up a lot to block a, a chair. I pretty well took Just it took my it. That's, it could be one of the one of the biggest changes that's caused this change in the wrestling industry now is the awareness of of what these kind of moves did um, and outruling them you know and and you're not able to do that you're not able to do that it's probably you know maybe they've not got the freedom anymore that that you had back right then, so. yeah I don't think they let them you know you, they just don't randomly go out. You know, Abdullah was one of those guys when you worked with him, you know, you were outside wrestling with him. It's like, grab that chicken bone up against the the fence. And it's like, how do you even see things like this? <laughs> but Abby had such great vision as far as where things were. Wow, yeah. You know, the crazier things, the better. I'd grab that board over there and hit me with it. I'm like, <laughs> it would have never crossed my mind. No. You know, so, I mean, he kind of got me looking at things in a different light. And it's kind of what got my... You know, after I left Puerto Rico, especially when I started working in Mexico and then South Africa, mm. that was when my style and stuff really got more violent. Yeah. The one person that springs to mind that you would have been quite suited with it was Mick Foley. Oh, I would have loved to have worked with Mick. I've met him a few times and stuff. Yeah. And 
So you, you never got a chance to sort of be in the ring or beside him or anything like that? No, I never got a chance to. Like I said, I would be backstage at a show or something like that or, yeah. you know, in a dressing room somewhere and stuff and meet, you know, meet him. And we got to where we recognized, he recognized me and stuff. We got to be on first name basis. And, oh, yeah. You know, we would sit and talk about different things. He's such a great guy. Mm. You know, really friendly and stuff. Very helpful with with younger, yeah. Rose tried to give guidance and stuff to them, and I always appreciated some of the things he told me. Yeah, As, he's another one of the guys that when you see him, I suppose you know, away from the ring, like he's 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 been very visual, you know, visible. I would say, right. In in recent years, you know, on social media or whatever, the real him. He's he's not the guy. He's completely different than what he was in the ring up to a certain oh, point. Really? You know, and you know his early Cactus Jack days again. Cactus and Abdullah together in WCW were right. frightening. Yeah, they, uh, but um, last couple of questions. Okay. So I've spotted as well whether this is right. I'm not sure. It could just be sort of the internet um, television. Sometimes fish. it's not always right. <laughs> Were you? Did you have any matches in the WWF? Sort of around sort of the early nineties. Um. Dark matches, yeah. Okay. Do you remember much about those who you were against or, you know, what it was like? Uh, not really. You know, um, Dusty Wolf was uh, my first tryout with WWE, I think it's WWF at the time. Mm. Uh, he was the guy that I worked with then, and I'd known, you know, we were both from Texas, so I'd known Dusty for a long time. Sure. Yeah. Um, I worked with D'Lo Brown on one. Oh, okay. You know, when they came out to South Africa and stuff, I would, I started doing the show there, to there with them. Yeah. Okay. Is there anyone sort of back in those days, taking it back to maybe the early 90s, from if you were, if you had a crack at the WWF, who you would have wanted to work a program with? Sean Michaels. You know, I got to work with Sean a little bit for his territory in San Antonio. I said, I got to do a little bit of an angle with him. Oh, wow. Okay. But, you know, his mind for the business is off the charts. Yeah. You know, so sitting there talking with him and stuff was always a great thing. And I always appreciated my time and stuff with Sean. Yeah. And that was probably 2000 or so. Okay. But I would have loved to have worked a program with Sean. I would have loved to work with Undertaker. That would have been yeah. one. I, I was kind of hoping you might have said that. That would have been one I would have. You know, Mark and I played college basketball against each other. Okay. So it was kind of weird stuff that we played each other. Oh, I guess we played each other twice a year for two or three years. Right. And I'd gone to Memphis where he was starting off. And, you know, I had said something about, uh, you know, I was asking somebody where was a good place to stay, you know, while I was there. And he said, well, I've got a couch if you want to stay there, then you don't have to pay for anything. Right. So next morning when he gets up, he had on a pair of Texas Wesleyan sweatpants. I'm like, wait a minute, stuff. I played against this, and then it just kind of both of us clicked at the same time. I know who you are now. Oh, cool. So, and so now and stuff, you know, whenever we see each other, it's, it's always a, you know, it's always a good thing. Yeah. Oh, that's brilliant. Now I, uh, he, he's, he's, I think he really does stand out as is one of the main pillars of particularly the area that i'm talking oh about. yeah mark, 80s, 90s, mark was yeah. just the, you know mark was he was a pillar for that company so. yeah and the way he reinvented himself over the years not many i think would have been able to stick keep yourself relevant for 30 years on tv all the time yeah you know having a 30-year career is one thing having a 30 career the 30 year career on television every week yeah. is something completely different. I mean, he went from that Undertaker to the badass character and yeah. back to the Undertaker again. So, yeah, he could, he could almost pick up, <laughs> he had all these personas, all these different versions of himself, and he just put and it all on whatever. Yeah. Uh, I wasn't sure when he came out with the American Badass one because I loved the fact that he's like his, his dead man female yeah. sort of ones. That was, that was it for me. And I thought, I don't know if if I really like him being out there being normal, you know. But yeah, I didn't like that one as well. I liked the, the true Undertaker gimmick yeah. and stuff, but the bells and lightning yeah. and all that kind of stuff. I like that gimmick a lot better. But I mean, it's yeah. You know, when he went to that 
the badass gimmick is that it actually allowed him to do some, you know, do things he wasn't used to doing anymore. Yeah. He wasn't used to doing promos and things like that. You know, they always kept him pretty quiet. Paul mm. Bearer did most of his stuff. Yeah. So when he went to the badass, then he was able to, you know, start doing more interviews. Yeah. And, it's like he's starting all over again. You know, he, he had this popularity. I mean, you can't start a character. I don't know anyone else who's started a character off already right. being that big. And right. just, you know, having the, the freedom to kind of see what you can do with it, you know. So, um, it brings me to my, one of my, my final sort of wrestling-related questions anyway, I think, possibly. I always like to do a little bit of fantasy booking with my guests. Uh-oh. <laughs> so this is, this is con- control is completely with you on this one. All if right. You, if you may, I don't know, you, you may surprise me. You may, you may to, um, decide to go a different way than... I think we've just spoken about, but if you, okay. if you had the freedom to book yourself in a match at WrestleMania, any WrestleMania, who would you have wanted to face? We're talking about sort of any era here. We don't have to be. Taker, I would have loved to work with, with Yoko. Yeah. You know, I, I would have loved that. That would have just been oh, the, okay. probably the crowning moment of my career is to work with him at WrestleMania. That would be cool. Um, so yeah, I would say those two. You could you could have come in after the Royal Rumble '94 when the Undertaker floated off, and you could have almost come in as a almost like a revenge kind of thing on his part, maybe. Right, that would have been quite cool. Never know. It's um sort of bringing it a bit more up to date because obviously you, you mentioned you retired a few years ago. Right. Sort of, what's your life like now? What, what um, talk about what you're doing because I know you've you've moved on to sort of a different career. Yeah, um, well, my wife and I own a uh, ghostwriting service, and so, so we write books. Oh, cool, okay. And then we can pretty well take a, a book from conception to the shelf or on, put it on Amazon. So we have that. We have a public relations company that, we've had, that we're doing pretty well with as well. Yeah. Um, you know, then I dabble with learning photography right now because I'm going to start doing some real estate photography for some a couple of realtors um and then our french bulldogs and stuff is where you know I'm, i've started raising french bulldogs cool. keeping yourself so busy. yeah you know of course now like i said i've got to deal with my parkinson's and, yeah sure you know everything else but i mean i get involved a little bit with mental health issues because i've dealt with depression most of my life okay so i, I that's a kind of a dear cause to me if anyone was to, to come to you at this stage of your life, knowing what you know about sort of life and the wrestling industry in general, you know, what would, if they came to you and said, I, I, I want to become a wrestler, what would your advice to them be? No. <laughs> <laughs> there, are, there are price tags you pay much, long, much later than your career. Yeah. You know, I mean, wrestling can be dangerous. Mm. You know, you can slip and hurt yourself. Somebody else can slip and hurt you. I mean, yeah. it, it's not a an easy life. One yeah, of the one thing the guys really, don't realize it. One of the things that really, really gets to me, I suppose, one of the statements I hear that really does wind me up is wrestling's fake. Um, because that will wind up any wrestler. Yeah, but it's not, you know, in some respects, I, I know what these people are referring to, but it's not fake. You know, what you guys do came with no risks. We can take the stuff that we do in the ring and hurt you with it. Yeah, yeah. You know, you got to remember, so if somebody gets an arm lock or a wrist lock, and stuff, we're not applying pressure to each other. No. You can take that same move and apply pressure to it, and I'll break your arm. Yeah. And it's it was a, one of those things in the nineties, you know, you get people stuff, oh it's fake, well come in the ring with me. Yeah. It's a, it's an extra talent, I think, if you learn how to do all this stuff, but you also learn how the the limit at which not to hurt someone with it. You know, nice. you're you're almost you're 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 demonstrating all the time, you're demonstrating all these moves and how right. safely to do it. But you yeah, like you say, you you've still got the ability to follow through with it if you want well, yeah because you'll get the people say oh it's fake and said well you let them do that mm. yeah yeah but i can if i really wanted to i can make them do that too yeah you know, especially my size you know i'm over seven foot and about 350 most of the time so i mean i was a big guy i mean I, yeah you know i had 23 inch arms and stuff 
most, much of the last 10, 15 years of my career. Wow. So, I mean, I was a big guy. I was strong. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, you could hurt people with the with the moves that we used in the ring. We just didn't put pressure on them. No, no. But uh, I, it's something I always wanted to get into, but I, I, I sort of physically, I I don't think I would have been able to withstand it. You know, watching it is much more fun. Well, I was fortunate and stuff too, because I didn't have to go this school route. Mm. You know, I, Dory took me and trained me individually. Yeah. So I didn't have to go through all the crazy... 10,000 push-ups and set-ups and no. Hindu squats and everything else. Dory got me in the ring and taught me how to wrestle. Do you think your size had a lot to do with um, it, it, when you decided you wanted to become a wrestler with, the, with these people sort of taking you seriously and, and, and sort of giving you these chances? Do you think your, your size and your physique in that era um, Oh, sure. Influenced sure. My, especially working overseas. Yeah. Because, I mean, I was always booked at 7'2". Mm-hmm. Okay. So, I mean, when I go into foreign countries, they hadn't seen a lot of those places, you know, like Mexico and Japan and India and places like They're not used to seeing guys my size. No, I suppose not. No. You know, so I was always a big attraction. It's kind of like Andre was in the 70s. Mm. You know, his cousin, I, you know, here comes a 7'2", often 400-pound yeah. You know, American coming in for the first time, well, people would show up at matches just to see what I looked like. Yeah. Let alone the wrestling. They, they were just curious and stuff about my size. Yeah, it was part of the attraction with Giant Gonzalez back in right. the 90s because, you know, build it eight foot tall. I, I, I'd never heard of a guy that big or since, you know, and say what you will it about what he could do in the ring. When but... I met him, I'm not used to looking up at people. <laughs> no, I bet. So, I mean, it was really strange for me to be looking up, and it wasn't just an inch or two. I mean, it was six inches or so. Yeah, I think he was seven or something like that. Well, he was seriously big. Yeah, it's just such a shame again. What you know, how it took its toll, how it took its toll on him as well. A bit like you know how how Yokozuna's condition, I suppose. It's, you know, right. These, these guys think if these guys had had another sort of yeah ten years in the ring, you know, right would have been uh, how it would have changed sort of the face of oh, it sure. at that time. Sure. Uh, listen, Jeff, thank you so, so much. This has been amazing talking oh, to I've you. Oh, I've enjoyed it. I've had fun. I, I really, really appreciate you, you coming on. You know, if at any point you want to come back, you know, we can, we can delve more into, into Just anything. Just let me know. Yeah, I will, mate. Thank you very I'll much. Be I'll be glad to be on with you anytime. Are you um are you on social media at all anywhere that people if they wanted to um to sort of keep up with what you're doing at the moment is there anywhere yeah can... I've got a, a jeffbearden.com website cool. uh, that has, it's mostly more stuff when I was doing motivational speaking and and things like that I mean our at large PR for our public relations company uh, Clarence Publishing for the book company and then of course I'm on Facebook and Instagram under, under Jeff Bearden. Cool. And I have a giant warrior page on Facebook and uh, everywhere, everywhere. Oh, I, I, can, be, everyone I can be found. <laughs> everyone, go out there, check him out. Thank you so much, Jeff Beard, and this has been amazing. So, uh, hopefully, Thanks, talk to you again soon. If you enjoyed this episode, please take a moment to like, share, and hit the subscribe button. Also, follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Once Upon a Turnbuckle to keep updated about all future shows.